I had two incredible parents. I have so much respect and love for them, but it was hurt and abused children raising hurt and abused children. And my father is a genius astrophysicist, but he also had a serious issue with alcohol. The whiskey bottle would uncork at 7.30 a.m. and it would hear glug, 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 glug. And my mother soothed by overeating, compulsively overeating, eating out of the grocery bags as we exited the store. And she was in so much pain back then. They prescribed diet pills, which diet pills were speed. So I was being raised by an alcoholic and a speed voting with a mental condition. And it was erratic. It was dangerous. Welcome to Linda's Corner, where we bring more hope, healing, and happiness to the world. Today, we're going to be talking about transforming childhood trauma into adult freedom. I'm delighted to welcome Susan Gold. Susan has a background in television and film, is a decorated endurance athlete, and she is the author of Toxic Family, Transforming Childhood Trauma into Adult Freedom. You can reach Susan at her website, susangold.us, and I'll include a link in the show notes. Welcome, Susan. I'm so glad that you could join with me today. Hey, Linda. I'm thrilled to be here. And wow, are you a pro or what? (laughs) Thank you. You are so kind. Now, I am looking forward to hearing your story. First, you have all the glitter, the amazing success, and working with movie stars and this whole Phineas and Ferb, getting him to interview people at them. And then after you tell some of these things, oh, and escaping from Alcatraz. That's pretty awesome. After we hear the awesomeness, then I would like to get into some of the rest of the story. Sometimes when we hear people's glitter and their gold, we think, man, they have this just charmed life. And that's not always the case. Well, I was really blessed to become known to matching celebrities with brands. Um, Probably before it was chic, my first deal was to knock on the factory door and convince Andy Warhol to do a commercial for Pontiac that he did not want to do, trust me. And that led me eventually to the attention of Roger Ailes, who had, um, he was running CNBC at the time and his own network called America's Talking. And he wanted that network weighted with celebrities and celebrities on the network. And they weren't biting at the bit to come on. So one night with the cameraman, I said, come on, we're going to this red carpet event. I'm going to interview the talent and then I'll have them look direct to you, right to camera, and they'll say their name and that they're watching our network. And it worked. So the head of promotions called me to his office, go get in here. And I thought, Linda, oh my gosh, I'm going to be fired. He said, Mr. Ailes wants to see you right away up in his office. He really likes what you're doing for the network with all this talent. (laughs) I'm like, great. So I went in and had a nice little conversation. And he said, I'm impressed. Name the show you want to work on. And then a little bit later, he was launching Fox News Channel. And he said, name name the show you want to work on. You're coming with us. You're going to help launch Fox News Channel. And ultimately, I was let out to L.A., Um, and did do a job with Disney getting those Phineas and Ferb cartoon characters to interview Taylor Swift and Jack Black and Ben Stiller and David Beckham. And it was crazy. A friend of mine was, was running reality programming for the network. And when she called me and said, I need your help. I need A-list talent to be interviewed by cartoon characters. (laughs) Are you out of your mind? But yeah, I would love to be a little fly on the wall and hear these conversations of how you're talking these people, how you're even getting in the door to be able to talk to these people, to ask them to talk to cartoon characters. So that's pretty amazing. I think a plus is that I'm very empathic, almost super empathic, meaning I really can sense the emotions and the, certainly the feelings of the people that I speak with and, and where they're at. And I can tune right into it and speak to it. So I think that's been one of my superpowers. 
Wow, that's wonderful. Oh my goodness, to be able to use that power to connect and then to be able to get. So, I mean, if you're connecting, that means you're creating a win win scenario. It's not just trying to convince somebody to get them to do what you want. That's beautiful. Well done, Susan. Oh my goodness. Well, I'd like to also hear about your endurance athlete and this, you know, escape from Alcatraz and all these other things that you're doing. Well, I I first focused on running and it was towards the end of college and it followed me to New York City. And I used to do loops around Central Park and New York Roadrunners Club was very popular at the time. And Fred LeBeau, the creator, had just started the New York City Marathon. And I thought, wow, that would be amazing to try to tackle that. And I did, that was my first marathon ever. And I fell in love with it, but ultimately I was becoming too injured. So here's my thought process. I'll spread it out over three sports. I won't just run, I'll swim and I'll bike too. And that should help me out on all the injuries I'm getting from all this running. Wow, that was some odd thinking. (laughs) Did did that work? Did that get the results you were hoping for? Well, I love triathloning and I thought I would do it for life. And I started in New York City and I continued on in Los Angeles triathloning. And it was really a great way to channel my frustrations. But ultimately, I was becoming too injured with that and then decided, okay, I'll focus just on master's swimming. And I hadn't been a swimmer before. And this is this is the tenacity. There were a few Olympians on the team that I was training with. So I hired them <laughs> to help teach me how to swim properly. And um, I also started kettlebell training and continued on with hot yoga. And I was training like an NC2A athlete, going to double workouts and, you know, all sorts of stuff. And within four years, I had the national ranking that I desired, Linda. But ultimately, I couldn't walk around the block from pushing my body so hard. So that false construct had to fall for me to see. Once again, I was trying to get that self-esteem and that self-worth from the outside in rather than the inside out. I was pushing my body way too hard, way too hard. And the universe helped me with that false mask falling by the wayside. Yeah. And I went through a seven-year odyssey of recovery from being able to marathon and triathlon and swim Alcatraz and swim swim all sorts of crazy three-mile ocean events to not being able to walk. And now I come from a place of what does my body feel like today? Is it just, you know, some nice gentle yin stretching? Is it a walk around my exceptional neighborhood? Is it a mountain bike ride? What do I feel like? There's no more huge endurance events in front of me or down the road six months that I'm training like a maniac for to achieve. And it's just bliss. Wow. Okay. So as you're describing this and these incredible things, first success on a professional level, and this interaction with what we consider our, you know, our superstars, our demigods of this world. And then also these incredible um, endurance events where it sounds incredible, amazing. And these are the things that we as a society usually value, that we're so excited and we're so impressed. We are impressed by these amazing accomplishments. And I had a wonderful friend who said, you know, we are impressed by accomplishments. We are impressed by strengths, but we are influenced by weakness. When we share our weakness, when we share the rest of the story. And as you're describing, it is common for us to expect that that peace, that just fulfillment, the satisfaction to come from the outside in. And then you said, actually, it comes from the inside out. And that is a message I would just love to 
drill again and again and again until people actually believe me. <laughs> because it doesn't sound sexy. When you say, what does my body want? Does it want a walk? Does it want some yoga, some stretches? You know, you do these things and people think, well, that's not thrilling. And it might not be, but it might feel good. And it's bliss. I love that word. So now that we've talked about some of these awesome, amazing things, and one crazy thing is because you have done awesome, amazing things, people listen to you. It's like, oh, she knows what she's talking about. So it has done awesome things. In addition to your resume, it also helps people say, oh, she's someone I want to listen to. But I would really like to hear the rest of the story. Well, I think it all started in a chaotic household. Um, I had two incredible parents. I have so much respect and love for them, but it was hurt and abused children raising hurt and abused children. And my father is a genius astrophysicist, but he also had a serious issue with alcohol. The whiskey bottle would uncork at 7.30 a.m. and it would hear glow, 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 glow. And he was a lot of fun, but he was often inebriated um, and a no-show when you really needed a father figure. And my mother was equally as genius. Um, and she was to have her turn at a higher education after helping my father get his master's and then his PhD. But that never came. What came were five children in very short succession. And I was the middle of those five children. And my mother soothed by overeating compulsively overeating, eating out of the grocery bags as we exited the store. And she was in so much pain back then. They prescribed diet pills, which I didn't understand, Linda, until I was in my mid-20s. Diet pills were speed. So I was being raised by an alcoholic and a speed body with a mental condition, I and it was erratic. It was dangerous. I wanted to escape. My initial memory was just about two years old. I was in the playpen way too long. I could feel my heels bounce up against that plastic padding and my fingers gripping around the wood slats and just hot and sweaty from the tears and the screaming. And when my mother finally did come, Let's just say it wasn't a pleasant experience. And that echoed through my childhood. And if it wasn't from the mother, it was from the father, or it was between the siblings, because there were very small scraps of love doled out on a consistent basis. Um, and I knew something was off when I grew up. I knew I just wanted to get to New York. I used to watch Barbara Walters on my beanbag in my basement, just hoping and praying. And as you know, I ultimately did make it to New York. I was 19 living in Greenwich Village on my own the first time and then went back after college. And Barbara Walters actually became an advocate and a friend. She was a personal training client of mine when I couldn't make enough money working at the talent agency, I trained people on the side and she became a client and actually supported me when I was sexually harassed in the workplace. She said, I'm coming to work with you this morning. We're going to confront this man together, Susan. So I've had a lot of serendipity, but I've also walked through a tremendous amount of pain. I mean, I the flags came up in my early 20s. I was repeating similar behavior that I had seen demonstrated in my family, abusive relationships, drinking to soothe pain. And a real red flag was when I took a slug from a wine jug in the refrigerator at work to ask for a raise. And it so replicated my dad at the dry sink, popping whiskey cork. Um, bottle open that I asked a friend. I told her I needed help. Did she know anyone I could speak with? She gave me a card for a therapist. I bravely walked into his office because back then 
Uh, you didn't talk to people and pay them money to listen to your problems in my family anyway. But I walked in and I said, my life is out of control and completely unmanageable. And he immediately started talking about alcoholism. How much did I drink? How much did my father drink? Was there alcoholism in the family lineage? And I didn't know why he was wasting time with all this because I thought drinking made me happy. But he recommended that I not drink while I was in treatment with him. And that was the first level of a solid platform that I needed to recover and to create an authentic life here. And from there, you know, I've, I've walked through many challenges as we all do. I mean, suicidal depressions, clinical depression, narcissistic abuse. Um, but what I've come to understand, Linda, like you, the players played their role perfectly in this movie that I signed up and agreed to. And I think maybe I'll check the fine print next time, but seeing them, the challengers, the challenges as opportunities for soul evolution has been absolutely transformational. And I'm really appreciative of the walk that I've taken. Wow, what a beautiful conclusion. I'm appreciative of the walk that I have taken. And as you described your parents with such compassion and such understanding that I I know what I endured and I know where they came in, where they came from and what their situation is and that is such a beautiful combination as we learn uh, to kind of look back at ourselves and where did I come from and why why am I the way that I am and why am I drawn to this and why do I handle this situation like this it's very common to recognize you know My growing up was less than stellar. And for about 85% of the population, I think we have what they consider a dysfunctional family where there's some element of less than awesome. And so it doesn't make us unique. We deal with it. But I love the compassion and the understanding that that you put in that. I really appreciate that, that it wasn't a blame game. It was an awareness. Oh. I'm following a pattern. I see that what I just did is something that my father did. I saw him do that. I'm following a pattern. And I think that is our default setting until we recognize that it is a default setting and that there is another way. I love when you talk to your therapist and and they were talking about drinking. You're like, that's not the problem. I mean, that's not, I I like that part. I don't know what you're looking at. (laughs) That's so funny. If you are willing, even from coming to that place of this is not the problem to listen to that advice and to make some changes, that is amazing because usually we're not willing to make a change until, you know, we, we choose ourselves and say, "Ah, I'm going to die or I'm going to change. Oftentimes we get to that point. So Beautifully done. I, I'm just so impressed. So let's. I would. Can we go into the narcissistic relationship a little bit? What, if you're, can you describe what that is? What it feels like, and if somebody is in that, what can they expect? What is not okay? And and what advice would you give to someone who says, "Gosh, you know what? What you're describing sounds really familiar." Well, like the word alcoholic and alcoholism, it didn't really have an effect on me. It was the same with the word narcissist and narcissism. And I know that word is bandied about way too often in our society, but I thought I went to LA for a career opportunity and it certainly was um, from New York City, but I believe I really went there to meet the man who was going to become my greatest guru as a teacher. And that was the man who would become my ex-husband. And shortly after I got to LA, I met who I thought was the perfect match. And that's oftentimes how it starts. And um, we were in a relationship for, I believe, four years before we decided, yeah, let's get married and let's have a child. 
And um, it was after our son was born that I really saw the mask drop and my machinery clunk and hiss. It was hard to decipher what was actually happening and the dance, the dynamic. I was still codependent since second grade and Billy Fritz, Linda on the playground, I needed male attention to feel whole. And that oftentimes didn't leave me picking from the highest fruit, but maybe the lower hanging. And even though my friends would say, you're so accomplished, you're so capable, you're amazing. I didn't feel that inside. And um, I had bought a home for our family and took care of it, all the maintenance, all, all the upkeep, all the taxes, the, yeah, the, the big bills, the down payments. And I was getting tired. I was also taking care of our son, um, almost as if a single mom would be taking care of him while in this relationship. And I was becoming drained. My life was becoming smaller. And every time I would point a finger out, three fingers would come back at me. But what I didn't understand was as an empath, I was taking on his emotion and making his responsibilities my own. And I could not separate because of the terror I still held in my cells of my being, of being abandoned. And ultimately, I tried to make him accountable through what's called a postnuptial agreement. We went to mediation. I didn't want our marriage to, to fall, even though I knew the expiration date was well past due. And we got to the final point in that negotiation. And I thought, oh, our marriage is saved. Thank God. When he folded his arms and his eyes went into those lizard-like cold slits and he said, I'm hiring an attorney and I'm filing for divorce. And I knew those words were my sentence to freedom delivered on a silver platter. And it was one calendar year of living in the same home. And I won't even say it was a home. It was more domicile. And this was the metaphor for the relationship that needed to fall on my head like a billboard to wake me up to what I was accepting and allowing and feeling worthy of. He held court in the master while I, by choice, took a mattress across our home into a partial conversion in our garage. And that was my monastery for the year it took to work through the paperwork to divorce him. And I held no contact, meaning no verbal contact and no eye contact with a man that I had loved and cherished, cherished for a calendar year, because that's what it takes to leave a narcissistic relationship, to, be, to break free. And within one calendar year, which is pretty quick, if you're not dancing that dance any longer, you have an option to be free. I was able to write him a six-figure check, and he could move on to his next source of supply. And I call him my guru, Linda, because he gave me an understanding of my true strength and a real understanding and love for that beautiful little girl, that inner child, that peace of my soul that lights up my heart. He gave me a connection to her, an authentic connection. And that's why I'm truly grateful. And my life started to transform quickly for the better. Wow. Okay. I, I, I want to go back over a little and ask a few more questions. So your description of after the papers are served, your living arrangements are in the same home, but you said it's not really a home, it's a house. And he is in the master bedroom and you are on a mattress in the garage. And this is a home that you paid for and that you're paying all the bills and you're doing all of these things. Okay. So, um, <laughs> in your kindness and your generosity, which I would love to talk on more, but for just a second, 
for those who are in a narcissistic relationship, I, I have another friend who, who was in one, and to describe a little bit of what that's like in her situation, anything was, as you put it, one finger, if you said anything, one finger pointed at you, it would be three back. So there's no acceptance of any kind of accountability, nothing to an, a narcissist, nothing is my fault. I am an angel. I am perfection and I deserve everything. And um, if there is a problem between you and me, it's obviously your fault because I am perfect. And this, this type of mentality is, is a challenge to, to, to work with. So um, anyway, just a little bit more clarification. Do you, do you have anything to add to that? Or is that a reasonable description? That's completely reasonable and almost to a T, yes. Okay. So now, now that we've uncovered just a, a little bit of, of the relationship that you were uh, trying to work with. Now, um, I, I again, I appreciate so much your compassion and your understanding and even gratitude that from this situation, you were able to discover more about yourself and to be able to find, recognize, and then heal that inner child. And sometimes we have to go through a situation where it's really, really bad before we are willing to say, oh, I'm fine, I'm fine, and recognize that there's something that needs to change. And how beautiful that you are able to recognize and even appreciate that process of awakening, even though I'm sure it was very, very hard. So thank you. And thank you for describing. Um, I, 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 just, I just love it. It's amazing that you are in such a good place to be able to describe these situations with such compassion. It is, it is beautiful. So let's say um, I'm, I'm Susan, I'm in this situation, I'm sleeping on the, this mattress in the garage, and I am starting to recognize, you know, there is a hurting inner child inside of me that needs some love. And you mentioned, you know, you always felt like I'm not complete. I, I'm, I'm abandoned. If I don't have the attention of someone, of, of a boyfriend, of a whatever, I'm not whole. So how do we get from that place to letting me be the one to feed that inner child and feel that wholeness from the inside out? Do you have some action steps of, you know, maybe I'm, I'm just realizing, you mean I do I have an inner child that's hurting? Do, do I do I need to heal? And if I do, how? Well, first is awareness, and that's a tough one because we can be doing a blind sleepwalk through life and not even realize we're stuck in some old outdated matrix and just pushing the ball down through the trap. So awareness is first, and then acceptance of your circumstances with compassion and love, and then action. And for me, Linda, it was really important that I did dialogue in therapy, talk therapy, to get my storyline down. But ultimately, it only served to re-traumatize me. What really has been helpful on a large scale and to shift my neural pathways and to shift me on a cellular level is to do more somatic modalities, meaning going into my body and exploring where I'm holding the trauma and just to identify it, color, texture, time period. Is it current? Is it from my past? Is it ancient? Is it from an ancestral bloodline that I am carrying this trauma through? And believe me, there's such toxicity in my ancestry. And that's part of the reason why I am having this conversation, this taboo conversation around this sacred topic of family. So we can start to clear the room of the debris and the toxicity. 
So that's what really helped me the most, the somatic therapies, because that's where I personally hold trauma. And it's where a lot of us do. And we just aren't aware of it. That is amazing. Okay, so thank you for bringing this up. You're probably familiar with the book, The Body Keeps a Score by Dr. Bessel van der Kolk, where it's one of the, um, uh, it, it, it's this beautiful bestseller where he explains uh, how our traumas, how these things actually become lodged in our body and that there are different ways. And I love you said there are different modalities. There are different ways to treat this. And some of them work better for some people. And some of them work better for other people. And he even talks about from a top down and from a bottom up approach. So we can do the talking. We can, we can talk and we can, and I think that's an important part of our awareness and our discovery. It's why, why do I feel this way? Where did this come from? But you mentioned that sometimes just bringing that up, that awareness doesn't heal it it can re-traumatize us. I don't want to live through that twice. I don't want to live through it once. And so isn't it wonderful that there are other ways that we can help to release that. And some of the ways of being able to recognize what's inside and finding it and then being able to release. And there's lots of different ways. And so I'm, I'm glad that you were able to find some. And that is, I, I hope, that people become aware that there's more than one way to do things. And if, if, if you're happy with whatever you're doing, carry on. But if you don't feel satisfied that you're getting the results and the healing and that peace and that freedom that you want, please open your eyes to some new ways to doing things and find something that will work for you. So well done. I, I thank you for sharing that. Those are some important aspects that, again, not everyone understands. I think when I was seven, my sister and I were playing with little kills, these little dolls with crazy fuchsia and green hair, you know, and um, we, they, there was a votive candle lit on the trunk behind where we were playing. She took one of her favorite little kittles and she said, give me that back. And I'm like, no. Yeah. And she said, give me my little kittle back. And I said, no. And she took my head and she pushed it back. And Linda, my hair caught on fire. And so I started rolling on the ground on the shag carpet, the yellow shag carpet, you know, like they taught us in school, stop, drop and roll. But I believe that was a spiritual initiation that I was going to light people's hair on fire with the way that I choose to look at experiences of our lifetime. And that's what I'm hoping to do with the story that I shared with you today and your listeners to have us see things with new perspective, to shift up and out, raise our frequency and step out of that old patriarchal paradigm that's just plain busted to freedom. So for you, when you're saying you're going to light people's hair on fire, what that means is this new awareness, right? And this light and this, so you're not actually going to light people's hair on fire. We don't need to have that conversation that that's not socially acceptable. Okay, good to know. (laughs) Is it okay if we talk a little bit about Clinical depression, what kinds of things can we do to help address this issue? Because it is huge. Yes, it certainly is. It hit me. I was doing a big business deal. It was a corporate merger and they wanted all this special talent performing. So it was a lot of high profile music acts. And I was the negotiator in the middle, bringing the two parties together. And it resonated my role between my parents. I would be the ref in some of their fights. And it sent me into a spiral of post-traumatic stress that I became disassociated and clinically depressed. And fortunately, friends could see it and they got me to a treatment center. There I was four and a half years clean. I'd never been to a rehab. And there I was in basically a treatment center for addicts and also for codependents. 
And I learned about clinical depression and I spent 10 years learning about clinical depression. And I did use medication off and on for a period of 10 years to sort of lift me up to a point where I could physically do the work that was necessary to move through the traumas that were holding me hostage. And ultimately, I came to understand what the triggers were, where the red flags were coming up. So I didn't have to get, you know, all the way to the ground floor in the elevator. I could get off on, on, on floor 11 before I hit rock bottom. And where it really came into play was that last two months of my divorce experience, things intensified and I started to feel that suicidal depression come on it, the, the thought like passed through. So I set up a friend for each day of the week, seven friends, and agreed to call one friend, the assigned friend on that day. And if I was feeling suicidal and they didn't answer, I made an agreement and left word that I would be calling the next friend on the list until I got someone live that could talk with me and talk me through. And that's the tool that I used to get me through that tail end of the divorce. And these tools are really so wonderful. Yes, I did need medication when I used it, but I haven't needed it in decades. And I'm really grateful for the process. I love the tools that you included. And I really love that you included medication as a tool. And I love it that it was a tool and not a crutch, that this is the tool that helps you feel good enough to be able to carry on while you investigated what the root is so you could heal the root and then be able to actually heal and move forward. I really appreciate that. Medication, there is nothing wrong with it. It is a wonderful tool, a wonderful resource, but it actually doesn't solve the problem. It is a tool to help us, um, you know, have that stability so that we can have the, the power and the ability to address the underlying issues. And I also love the connection and the friends that you use. That is huge. That is hard because sometimes when you're in that depression, you just kind of close in and it couples with social anxiety and I'm not in the mood to talk to anybody. So that courage that you exhibited to be able to say, this is what I need. And I have people who care about me and who are willing to help me. And, and just even that knowledge is so empowering. So thank you to all of those wonderful friends who were there for you. And thank you for being willing and courageous enough to reach out to them. If everyone who struggled with clinical depression could follow those steps, reaching out, asking for help, having that check-in, using the medication to keep you in a good place while you search for the underlying causes, it, it would it would it would take care of almost everything. So what a wonderful example you are, Susan. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. It's been great to be here today and have this conversation with you and including your listeners. I'm just so grateful for what you do and creating this safe haven for this incredible content. And the walk you are doing to produce it, it takes time, it takes effort, it takes finance, it takes heart. And thank you. Oh, Susan, I appreciate that. Is there anything else that you want to make sure that we cover before we close today? No, I'm just grateful. If people feel the need and you want to connect, just go to susangold.us. It's all there. Perfect. In closing, I'd like to share a quote by Alice Little. She said, as traumatized children, we always dreamed that someone would come and save us. We never dreamed that it would, in fact, be ourselves as adults. If you've experienced any form of childhood trauma or abuse, I invite you to be the one who transforms childhood trauma into adult freedom. See you next time on Linda's Corner. Thanks for listening. Please share and subscribe to help us reach new listeners. 
And if you'd like to heal your life from the inside out, there is a free video series at hopeforhealingfoundation.org. Just click on the free stuff tab. I also invite you to grab a copy of one of my books, like Crushed, A Journey Through Depression, and You Got This, an action plan to calm fear, anxiety, worry, and stress. See you next time on Linda's Corner. Thank you.